Oh, come, let us adore him. Just go ahead and stand oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the
Amen. Joy. Unspeakable joy. Yes. are about God being with us in this Christmas season where we're praying and we're seeking his face. We know that he is with us. We want to be with him. You are with us. You are You are with us. 
on the mountain, in the valley, in the crowded streets, or the empty desert, in our hope, and in our waiting. We are never alone. God is with us. God is with us. Say that out loud, would you? God is with us. He's with us in the valley. And that's where we're going to go for the next several weeks as we lead up to Christmas, is we're going to be talking about God with us. It's going to be a, it's going to be a blast. And every week we're going to read Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, kind of a theme verse uh, to take us through that. Let's just go ahead and read it as we begin. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, say this out loud, God with us. So you'll notice in your copy of scripture, that's in caps, or, or at least it's in quote, quotations. Why is that? Here's what, it, here's what that means. It means it's a quote from the Old Testament, a book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, where God had promised Isaiah there that there was going to come a child who would be God with us. And he tells us here that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy. God is with us. God with us. And again, that's the title of the series. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've come to know him as your Lord and as your Savior, then you understand that God is with you when times are good, right? I mean, most of us get that pretty easily when you're on the mountaintop or when you get good news in your life, you get a raise. God's with us. The baby sleeps all night for the first time. You, you pull into the mall and you get the best parking spot. Like God just kind of parted the Red Sea for you. It's easy to sense the presence of God, isn't it? When things are going good. But what happens when things are tough? Let's, let's ask that question. It's sometimes difficult, isn't it, to, to experience or sense the presence of God when you're in a valley, when things aren't going your way, when you get some bad news, when, when you're hurting, when you're lonely and you're afraid and, and you're worried. How many of you know what it is to walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Some of you do, and, and you know the difference between the mountaintop and the valley. You, you know, we all have those seasons, those pockets of, of life that, that are really, really good. Your marriage is blessed, but then maybe you have a kid who's making crazy, stupid decisions, and, and it's just dragging you down into the valley. Or you're really, really close to God and, and you sense his presence. But, but at the very same time, you're, you're afraid you're going to lose your job. Maybe your family is, is gathering for the holidays and you're super excited. I mean, getting together with family. But then you get some bad medical news about you or someone else. Those mountain tops are great, but, but then there's the valleys. And in scripture, valleys are interesting. When you study the word of God, they represent a lot of different things. Bat battles take place in valleys. You know, some of you may understand that one quite well, right? Some battles that you're fighting. Maybe even right now, you're fighting some battles. Wow. You know what that is to, to fight those battles when you're in those valleys and, and you can't see and, and you don't understand and, and things look bad. It's, it's those valleys or seasons of time. Sometimes it's those valleys in the scripture that represent desperation. Valleys in the scripture you see are sometimes seasons of loneliness. And some of you might be experiencing that even now. But it's interesting to me when you study these valleys in the Word of God, it's also true that valleys are places of growth. Imagine that. 
And so with that in mind, I want you to write this one down. We may enjoy God on the mountaintops, but we get to know him intimately in the valleys. Now, now don't, don't just gloss over that. We may enjoy God on the mountaintops. Somebody say, yeah, that's right. But, but we get to know him, we get to know the character and the personality of God when we're walking through some difficult moments in life. We get to know him intimately. We get to know him differently in those valleys. That's, that's where we start this journey to Christmas today, talking about God in the valleys. So turn in or turn on, if you would, to Psalm 84. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 84. And chances are, you've probably read Psalm 84. If you have, you might have run right past these verses. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've studied these extensively. But I want us to look at them today and begin with verse 5. If you're there, say, I'm ready. Some of you aren't ready. If you're there, say, amen. All right, so we speak that language. Verse 5, read it with me. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Verse 6, and as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. And, and write out in your notes, blessings. Uh, that's another word there. Verse 7, and they go from strength to strength. Underline that. From strength to strength till... till each appears before God in Zion. Now, the Valley of Baca, we need to do a little bit with that, right? The Valley of Baca was most likely related to a tree. Uh, this tree would ooze sap. And when you walked by it, you would be able to visibly see this, this oozing of this sap coming out of this tree. It was sometimes called a weeper. It looked like the tree was crying. You get the picture. That's why the Valley of Baca is translated in different ways in Scripture. It's called the Valley of Tears. It's called the Valley of Weeping. It's called the Valley of Loss. It was a dangerous place, this valley. Thorns and wild animals, people waiting to jump you. It was a tough place to be. It was a tough valley to get through. And typically, something bad is going to happen as you go through this valley, kind of like driving down Glenstone at five o'clock in the evening, right? So something bad is probably going to happen. So, so that's why verse five is so important. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, the Lord. And by the way, if you're not a follower of Jesus today, and maybe you're here in this building or maybe you're with us online and you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, and, and so you find yourself in a valley and you become overwhelmed. You say, yeah, I get the valley thing. I'm with you on that metaphor. I understand clearly. But when I'm in this valley, I'm overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. And then you say things like this. I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. Because what you have is all you have. Now listen to me. If you're not a follower of Christ, what you have is all you have. When the book of Proverbs says to lean not on your own understanding, but lean on the power and understanding and the admonitions of God, you don't have those to lean on because you don't know him. And so you find yourself in the valley and you're exhausted. I mean, listen, you are totally overwhelmed. You don't know where to turn. You don't know where to reach out to. The valley is a spooky place for all of us. But for those without Christ, it's a place where you have all you have. But now listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you know him, you have a strength that goes beyond what you have. And then when you get to the end of your own strength, there's a heavenly strength, a divine strength, a strength that comes from God that's available to those who know him. Let me show you an example of that. Are you ready to see an example of what that looks like? Watch this. Hello, everyone. I just want to give, give you guys an update on my mother, Judy Mills. Here you go. I am my body. Thanks for all the prayers. To God be the glory. You see that? <laughs> now, that would be what you would call an example of strength that's beyond your own strength. There's strength available to those who know God. Somebody say amen. amen. You know about it. There's a bigger 
power. There's, there, there's a strength that is bigger than COVID-19. There's a power that's bigger than our own strength. And when you hit the end of your own strength, his strength is made perfect in your weakness. And if you're in a valley right now, you have access to the very real present power of a living God, a God who is available and ready to meet you where you are in that valley. Notice this. The text doesn't say blessed are those who make it on their own. It doesn't say blessed are those who pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. It doesn't say blessed are those who are really determined. Blessed are those overachievers. Blessed are those who are able to do it on their own. See, one of the big problems we have in our world today is that we almost idolize independence. I'm just going to make it on my own. I, I don't need anybody at all. I'm going to be financially secure and independent. I'm going to be completely good on my own. I don't want to trust anybody. I don't want people to be there for me. I don't need God, and I don't need anybody else. You see, the problem is that is that we were created not to be independent, but we were created by our God to be dependent on him and dependent on others. See, blessed are you when you realize that you are dependent and you have a power greater than your own strength. Some of you need to lean into that. Some of us today need to understand that I can't do this on my own. We need to get over the fact that we're un, I mean, I just, we need to get over the fact that we're unable to accomplish these things. Because the fact is, is we're not able to make it through the valley without his strength. We're just not. I mean, all we have is all we have. And if all we have is something other than God, then that strength is going to be depleted. You're not going to be able to make it. Some of us need to lean powerfully into that. And we just need to admit that we don't have what it takes. I need his presence, and so do you. Blessed are those whose strength is found in God. I want to show you verse 5 in a little different translation because I love the way the New Living Translation highlights this verse. Notice what it says in the New Living. Uh, it, it, It says this, What joy, what joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord who set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Now, I love that part because we're on this pilgrimage to Jerusalem. You say, what does that mean? Well, we may be in the valley, but we're going to what was known as the city of refuge. These are worshipers who are going through the valley of Baca, and they're making their way to the holy city, and they're making their way to the place of worship. They're going to the place of refuge. They're going to the place where they will find peace, because it's called the place of of peace. And that's where they're going. One commentary said this. It said, to get to the city of refuge, you had to travel through the valley of tears. And I love that imagery. Do you get it in your mind? Sometimes to get where you really appreciate the presence and the power of God, you have to push through a little bit of pain to get to the presence of the goodness of God. Too many of us give up in the valley of Baca. Too many of us give up when our strength is depleted and we trust in our own understanding and we don't allow him to take us to the place of peace. And it's usually just one of two things in your life. Now listen to me, it's usually just one of two things. Brittany and I were driving down the road uh, you know, a week or two ago and we were having this awesome discussion and, and it really sparked something in my mind and I, I began to think and I thought, well now here's another book that needs to be written. Here's something else that needs to be said. And I don't think we talk about it near enough. The fact is, is that everybody in this building, everyone listening to us online, everyone tuned in and connected today, tends to fall in one or two areas of their life. They have the mountaintop experience. They understand what that is. If you're a believer, you know what it is to walk with God in the presence of God because you've experienced that in your life, but there's something dragging you back down to the valley. It's the reason why people drop out of church a lot of times is because they don't work through the difficult moments that come inevitably in everyone's life when you're in the valley. We give up too soon. We give up too easy. 
We walk away from the truths. It's like I, I'm counseling a guy. I was talking to him the other night on the phone. He was having a traumatic experience. And I said to him, don't forget what God told you in the light when you find yourself in the dark. It's so easy to forget all of the things that God has promised and given to you when you were in the light, when you were on the mountaintop, but now you find yourself in a valley and you forget all of that stuff. <laughs> you forget it because the noises are spooky and there are thorns in the valley and, and, and it's dry and desolate and you're wondering, how am I ever going to get out of this? We had the funeral for 107-year-old Val McKelly Friday right here in this place. And, and it was an awesome experience. And, and we were talking and encouraging the family and comforting the family. But we could say, here's a 107-year... Do you even know anybody else other than Valma that's lived to be 100? Go ahead, raise your hand. You know anybody that's lived to be 107? Anybody? Yeah, see, I mean, that's, that's an accomplishment. But I want to tell you what's more impressive than that. Not living to be 107, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, most of us probably won't be able to say that. But what's really more impressive than that is this. When she was 29 years old, Mrs. Erickson Invited her to a Bible study in her neighborhood, and she said, I'm not going to that. I don't want to do that. Later on, she confessed and said, well, I was really kind of rude and mean, and I'm ashamed of that now. <laughs> Ultimately, she went to Mrs. Erickson's Bible study class. She got on her knees. She received Christ as her Lord and as her Savior. And for 81 years, she served the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's more impressive to me than the longevity of years is the fact that she served him with everything she had. Yeah, and we celebrate that. Because most of us have difficulty when we get in the valley. It's what we hear. And Brendan and I were having this discussion. We were talking about this as we were driving down a road. And, and people were coming to our mind. And, and I was thinking, you know, you know, I've seen this my entire ministry. I've seen people who would be on the mountaintop with God. Be on the mountaintop. So gifted. So talented. I mean, God has given to them such grace and mercy. And yet today, because of one or two things in their life, they've dropped out completely out of the service of God. I said, that just blows me away. Now, I get it. There have been times in my life in some of those valleys where I have questioned a lot of things. So I understand. But isn't it tragic when we don't go from our strength to his, it's joy. You get joy. That's what it says. For those whose strength comes from the Lord. You've set your mind on a pilgrimage. Now, now this, is, this is why the psalmist said it. Let me show you the first part. He said this, what joy, what joy for the strength that comes from the Lord. Do you want some joy in your life? And, and don't miss this part. They not only had joy, but they received that joy because they set their minds on a pilgrimage, they decided, I'm going, I'm going. Now, now, everybody say something with me out loud, will you? My mind is set. Say it. My mind is set. Blessed are those who have their minds set toward God. Because what you think about matters. It matters a lot. What you think about matters. Paul talked about that in the New Testament to those Colossian believers. You may remember, he said, set your mind on things above, not on things below. Paul even told those, in, uh, those Philippian believers, he said, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy or admirable or lovely, think about those things. Because here's why. Because where you are, where you are is one thing, but what you think, something else completely. That's in your notes. Write that one down. Because what you think about matters. You guys remember there used to be a show on TV called what were you thinking? <laughs> I don't know if it's still running at all, but they would have crazy uh, people on there with snakes and holding them and jumping off of roofs with cardboard wings and that type of, uh, doing all kinds of crazy, stupid things. And then they would ask the question, what were you thinking? Well, 
I remember that question quite a bit. As a child growing up, I was a little ornery. You might not be believing that. I get it. You, you're saying, no way, preacher. You would never be an ornery. Yeah, I was pretty ornery. And my mom would say things like this to me. What were you thinking? And I would answer her, as you well know, the same answer that you provided. I don't know. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? It was the same question that was asked, that I asked myself when I jumped out of that perfectly good airplane and skydived. I thought, what am I thinking? I was awesome, by the way. What was I thinking? Brenda asked that question too, but she jumped as well. What, what you think about matters. What are you thinking? What do you think about what you think about really matters. Now listen, I think somebody needs to hear this. Maybe somebody in this room or, or, or somebody with us today. You, you, what do you think about in the valley? See, you can be in a certain place and be thinking about something completely different. Just ask the guys that work for me. <laughs> They're thinking about something completely different when they should be thinking about where they are. And yet, listen, sometimes you can be in places and you, your mind can be thinking about other things. And there are times when that is absolutely necessary. Somebody today, right now, your current situation, you're in a valley but your mind can still be set upon God. Your heart is now racing, but your mind can be set on God. I mean, listen, your soul is aching, but your mind can be set on God. The fact is, is when you set your mind on God and toward God, blessed are those. That's when you find joy. I mean, for some of you, there's some pressure right now, and you're beginning to feel it. It's December the 5th, and the ball is rolling. Listen, it's getting close well, the big fat guy in the red suit's coming around the corner. It's happening whether you want it to or not. I don't ask you the question, are you ready for Christmas? Because I, that means something, to every, something different to everyone. The fact is, the best way to be ready for Christmas is to get your mind on the things of God. Because here's why. Because you're thinking about all that other stuff. I mean, listen, we gotta, we, we got to hang that tinsel stuff, and, and we've got to put things outside, you know, and, and we've got to get the tree out, and oh my goodness, we got to get all of those things. we got to cook, and we got to stuff the turkey. we got all of these things, the presents, what are we going to do? And your mind might be racing, even today. Christmas for you might be, how in the world am I going to get along with that relative who I know is coming? <laughs> For some of you, it might be, how are we going to pay for the things that we believe need to be paid for? Listen, there may even be a real tragedy in your life in this valley, but with your mind set on the goodness of God, he is with me. He is for me. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. My God is going before me to prepare a way for me. The Spirit gives me strength when I am weak. Do you understand? I need him every moment of every day because his words are a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, and I cannot make it any other way. His power is very, very real. And I may be in the valley, you may be in the valley, but my mind is set on the kingdom of God because why? I'm on a pilgrimage to this place of peace and you may be in a valley, but your mind can be fixed on God. Did you get that? Yeah, yeah. Look at, look at verse 16. By the way, the valley is the pathway to the place of peace. It always is. And, and look at verse 6. In verse 6, well, there's the one I wanted you to get a minute ago. Where you are is one thing. What you think about is something else. I don't know how I got messed up, but here's number 6. As they pass through, underline, pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. As they pass through the valley of Baca. In other words, we may be in the valley right now, but the valley is not our destination. What we are doing is just passing through. I may be in the valley right now, but it's not my home. I, I, I'm journeying. I'm pilgrimaging through uh, to this place of peace, and I'm just passing through. My God's going to get me through this. I'm just passing through. You remember David said something like that in Psalm chapter 23. He said this. He said, even though I walk, well, let me just have you help me. Are you ready? Come awake and, and help me with this. Even though, what does it say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And God, by the way, if you haven't ever done a, a study on this, I'm sorry, I messed you up. If you haven't ever done a study, do this. 
Underline that word shadow and, and, and begin to think about what that really means. I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's fearful. I'm scared. I don't like it. There are some scary things going on around me, but, but it's just a shadow because I am walking in the power of the Almighty God. His strength is enabling me to walk through this difficult moment in my life. So it's a shadow of death. I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Say that again. For what? God's with us. Isn't that what it says? So I may be in the valley, but notice I'm just passing through. Yeah, it's a difficult time in my life, but God's going to get me through. I may be hurting, but I'm going to be, not, I'm not going to be hurting forever because my God is going to pull me through. Every dark place in the valley is going to pull me through. We're just passing through. Baca, the valley of Baca. Sometimes when you're in the middle of it, you just want to get out. Now, now let's be honest. Don't you say to God at times when you're in the valley, just please make it stop. I don't want this anymore, but make it go. Just take it away. I want out. See, what you have to realize is so often God may show you that the way is through the valley, not out of the valley. The road to the path of peace is often through the valley. You, you, you understand the path to peace is so many times through the valley. Just passing through, though. And, and I love this next phrase in verse 6. Don't miss this. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a, they make it a place of what? Of springs. Did, did you get that? As they pass through the valley, they make it a, and the King James says it like this, they make it a well. Now, in other words, here's what happens. Whenever you're in a dry place, what do you do? Whenever you're in a valley, what do you do? You dig, you make a well, and you take and clear a little hole, and you place a container, and you await the provision and the power of God as he promises to send the rain. God hasn't sent it yet, right? You're saying it's not there. It's dry. And, 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 but when you're dry and when you're hurting, you make room for the presence of God and the provision of God. But it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't rained yet. You're discouraged. But God's going to provide. Understand, I need him to bring about his reign in my life, and I need to be prepared. It's almost as if God would say something like this. You know, you, you show me your faith, and I'm going to show you some faithfulness. If you dig it, I will fill it. I will show up. You, you, you see, for me, it's all those if, if statements in the Bible. You, you guys know what I'm talking about? When God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and then I will heal their land. If you keep my commandments, if you abide by my commandments. You see, in the New Testament, uh, you, you remember Jesus had this same idea. There, there's a guy in the New Testament who had a withered hand. You, you may remember it. Instead of Jesus just coming along and saying, hey, just be healed, go, go on. Jesus said, no, what I want you to do is stretch out your hand, and I'm going to heal it. You show me that you believe, and I can do it, and I will do it. You remember the guy, 38 years, uh, here he is, he couldn't walk. And Jesus didn't say, by the power of Jesus, you're healed. Instead, here's what he said. He said, you take up your mat and begin to walk. Pick it up. I'm going to show. You do something, then I'm going to do something. You see, if you show me your faith, if you show me your faith, I will show you my faithfulness. I don't know who this is that needs this today. But there's somebody that needs to hear this. You need to start digging. <laughs> you say, oh, well, I'm in a valley. What are you doing? Start digging. Get ready. Get ready for the provision of God. Get, get ready for the soon power of God to be revealed in your life. What are you doing? You're in a valley. Well, start digging. Instead, we tend to just want to sit down and say, all right, God, just handle this. Well, yeah, I'll be over here, you know, underneath this one tree. Just let me know when it's time for me to come out. If, if you plant it, he, he, he will grow it. You, you, you have to plant the seed before you see the harvest. If you pray it, and I, this is not prosperity preaching, so don't get me wrong. I believe that God responds to the faith of his people. 
If you pray and you seek his face, he says, I call on my name and I will answer, he says. Yeah, that means you got to dig it if you prepare. I believe God himself, he will reveal it when you're in the dry place. You make a well, that's what it says. You prepare for the presence and the power and the provision of God. If you show me your faith, I'll show you my faithfulness. And I love the if promises. We see them all through scripture. If you draw near to me, God says, I will draw near to you. The Bible says, if, if you seek me, you will find me. If you make room for me, I will reveal myself to you. There's somebody that, that you, you're here today and you haven't sensed the presence of God in a long time. I mean, if you were, if you were honest, you'd say, you know, it's been a long time since I've really sensed the presence of God. Well, here's what I'm going to say to you. If that's you, dig a well. Just dig a well. I, I mean, dig a well so that God can provide what he wants to provide in your life. Dig a well. It's time to say, I'm going to stop and wait for your presence I'm going to dig a well and say, Lord, I know you're going to fill it. I'm going to prepare for your provision and your presence because if you dig it, he will fill it. Now, I want you to think about this. Think about this. Some of you really need an encounter with God. God re rarely reveals himself to people who are rushed. Now, I'm going to go to the other extreme. You got a minute? You're here. Let's just take a few minutes. See, see. This should sink into somebody because he rarely reveals himself to people who are rushed. Imagine Moses. Get the picture. The burning bush and Moses is driving by 75 miles an hour in that new Maserati of his. And, and he sees this bush burning. And he decides he's going to take a picture. Oh, wow. What a great Instagram story this will make. This bush is burning. But that's not what God says. God says this, hey, hey, why don't you just stay a while and take off your shoes because you are standing on holy ground. Why, why don't you just take a moment to be still? Be still and know that I am God. Why don't you make a well and then you wait for me to fill it? Now, some of us, me included, we need to hear that word. We, we need to slow down. I mean, we hit this time of year, and we're so busy in the commercialization of Christmas. Listen, I believe Christmas. I believe there's two main miracles that we, we ought to talk about as the church, as the body of Christ, as evangelicals. I believe those two miracles are the, the resurrection of Christ. That's a, a, a big event in our life. He conquered death. I mean, now we can say with Paul, the apostle of death, where is your sting? It's gone. Why? Because Jesus conquered the grave. That's a huge miracle. Do you know anyone who's been risen from the dead? <laughs> yeah. If you know Jesus, you do. Now, there's a great miracle. Let me give you the second one. And I believe this second miracle is probably the miracle that people are now in our post-Christian society are realizing that they can make a connection with the body of Christ. And it's this experience around the incarnation, the Emmanuel, God with us, this birth of the one and only son of the living God. This Christmas experience is a miracle. Miracle. Do you know many virgins that have given birth? Wow, let's start there. That's amazing. And Joseph is going, wow, well, listen, I know I am engaged to marry uh, Mary, but she's pregnant. And I'm not too sure about all of this. As a matter of fact, he needed an angel to come around and help him better understand, hey, it's okay, man. It's okay. Because the one thing Joseph knew is that he was not the father. He was convinced of that, but she's pregnant. She's going to have a child. And the angel had to say to Joseph, hey, it's okay. It's all right. Uh, the one in whom is in her womb is, is God. She's giving birth to the son of God. And Joseph had to back up and say, hmm, okay. But, 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 but can you imagine? Listen, that's a miracle, and we ought to celebrate that miracle. It's a time when people should 
begin to connect with the body of Christ. It's a time, and I believe that in these next four weeks, there will be opportunities for you and for me and for others to say, hey, come and, and, and experience the real reason for this season. Come be a part of this miracle. But people need to dig it. When you dig it, he'll fill it. If you seek me, you'll find me. If you draw near to me, he'll draw near to you. And, and, and some of you, it's just time to prepare. You say, are you ready for Christmas? Are you prepared? And some of us need to say, to prepare for the God who is with us, we simply need to say, God, I'm going to allow you to fill the, the, that place in my heart. I'm in this valley, God, and I need your provision and I need your power. Enter into the season like that. Some of us just need to get on our face before God and say, I just need you. I need you now. Here's what I hope you'll understand in this time we've had. God never, ever promised you that you would never go through a valley. Yeah. He never promised you that you were going to tip through those, through those tulips, that everything was just going to rock along in a way that was tremendously pleasing to you. What he did promise you is you would never have to go through a valley alone. He didn't promise you that you wouldn't be there, but he promised you that he would be there, God, with us. And the virgin will be with child, and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Us. And I love the way the psalmist phrases this portion of scripture. He says, as we journey through the valley of Baca, we're going to the place of peace. And then he says, they go from strength to strength. And I love this phrase. They go from strength to strength. Get that. Because here's what we get confused. Sometimes we think as believers that discipleship is an instantaneous experience. And it's not. You see, it's going from strength to strength. It's a step-by-step -step experience. That's why I challenge people to find their spiritual gifts and to do three things, connect, grow, and serve, and keep taking the steps. Keep taking the steps. Even when you get in the valley, keep doing these things because as you do those things, you go from strength to strength to strength to strength. You become stronger the more you connect, grow, and serve. You do. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an old weightlifter. I've, I've thrown a lot of iron around in weight rooms in my life as an athlete. And, and, and I, I understand uh, the, the law of how to build muscle. And the way you do that is by tearing down muscle and it becomes stronger. The more you go through that rigorous process, you may start out on a bar, a 45 pound bar, and you may be hanging some 45 pound weights. And, and now you, now you're going to, you're going to pump that iron and, and you're going to start off. Maybe you can get three sets of 10, maybe not, but you're going to pump that. And as you do that, you're tearing down the muscle that you have and you're building that muscle. And then as that muscle gets stronger, then you're going to throw a few more, uh, a, a few more weight onto the bar. And, and at some point you're going to look back and, and you're going to max out and you say, wow, I can only do 180 on the bench and I can do 320 now. That's amazing. You didn't get there overnight. It it became a process of growth in your life as you went through the rigorous pain to strengthen your life. Now, that's physical, but spiritually, it's the same truth. You got to go through the stuff. You got to get through the valley. When you have difficulty in your marriage and you're in a valley and you trust God and you don't lean on your own understanding and you understand that it's not my strength that's going to get me through the valley, but it's his strength and I'm going to trust in him and I'm going to dig a well and he's going to fill it with his provision because he is with me. Blessed are those who experience the strength of God. Blessed are those whose strength is found in you. Then they go from a little bit of strength to a little more strength and even more of God's strength and then a little more of God's strength until each appears before God in Zion. They've arrived at the place of peace. They go from strength to strength. But notice this is not our strength. It's his strength. See, when you can't handle anymore, lean into him. 
Let his strength be everything that you need. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear evil. Why? Because God, you are with us. Who are you? You're the Emmanuel. Who are you? You are God with us. Whether I'm on a mountaintop or whether I'm empty in my life in a valley and I'm hurting, the good news is our God meets us wherever we are. Because the word became flesh. And it dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the sinless son of God who loved and reached out to people who were hurting and broken and in their lives they were torn apart and he loved them just as they were and he never ever left them there because he gave them strength. I know that because Jesus becomes sin for us on the cross. He takes our sin our burden, our debt, and he died in our place. On the third day, though, the stone was rolled away and he wasn't there. Why? Because by the power of God, he defeated death, hell, and the grave so that anyone, this includes you and me, anyone, and it doesn't matter what you've done, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And your sins can be forgiven. You would be made completely new You're if you're at the top of the mountain or you're in the deep darkness of the valley. The only thing separating you from him is your sin. The only thing separating you and I from a holy God is our sin. What we need is forgiveness of our sin. What we need is life that only he can bring, abundant, eternal life. Maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe that's the reason you showed up. And so that you could hear about the mercy of God. You could hear about the love of God. And so today, let me challenge you to do something. Say to the Lord, I turn from my sin. I turn toward Jesus and I call on the name of Jesus. And I'm going to dig a well. I want to meet him there. I know that God is with you. Do you know God is with you? That's the greatest blessing there is. That's, that's the blessing we celebrate at Christmas. God with us. The Son of God coming to earth to be with us. God with us. God with us. It's a wild idea, really. Because can anybody truly be with God? I mean, in his holiness, in his glory, in his splendor, who could be with God? What if, what if God chose to be with us? What if the creator of time and space himself stepped from eternity into mortality and wrapped himself in skin and looked humanity in the face and said, I'm with you. What if he chose to meet us in the silence and say, I'm with you? What if he chose to stare into your doubt and hold your confusion in his hands and walk beside you every step of the journey and say, I am with you? It's a wild idea, I know. But what if God with us? <laughs>